Chick tracts were created by a guy named Jack Chick. They are propagandistic, far-right comics that are left all over the place, bus benches and everywhere. I wanted to read this chick tract called Sin City. It's an anti-LGBT chick tract. But first, let me tell you how I came across this. I went to the Pride Parade in New York City in June 2024, and I actually marched in it. On my way back from the Pride Parade, I was going through the 42nd Street subway station in Manhattan, and I saw this big setup of chick tracts all over the place, and they had like chick tracts in every language. So I went up and I grabbed one. There's a big sign next to the chick tract display that says, Jesus saves from hellfire, King James Bible Baptist Church. Believe it or not, the chick tract that was on display, or one of them, was anti-gay. Big surprise, right? So let's read this chick tract. Here's how it starts. Run over him, he's trying to stop the parade. You gay basher. What the dot dot dot? Get that idiot out of here. Kill him, what do you think you're doing? Under the text, we have an image of a protest. Next page, stinking straight. Homosexuality is an abomination. See Leviticus 2013. That's a hate crime, kill him. You devil, nobody stops my parade. I'll tear him to pieces. Nobody says this. Nobody is looking for people to, like, murder at pride parades. You know how I know that? Because I covered one not too long ago. I showed video of a guy named Nicholas Bowling. Nicholas Bowling Ministries. He goes to pride parades and harasses people. Nobody swarmed him. Nobody attacked him. Nobody wished death upon him. At worst, this guy was there harassing people. Wouldn't go away, wouldn't leave them alone. And they said, you're terrible, you suck, you're getting people killed. That's about as far as it went. Temptation of the devil. And you gave in to the temptation, but Jesus came to set us free from the power of sin. He came to set us free. How am I judging you? I'm telling you there's good news. I'm telling you there's hope. I'm telling you Jesus came. Jesus came to bring hope, to bring joy, to bring love. Jesus did what to bring hope? energy right now it's not good energy energy well the holy spirit is the one who who has the power For sure no the point is that you're being a scumbag i thought that was pretty clear but okay jesus is great and i think he loves me regardless he died regardless for our sins what? so he died for our sins right he died on the cross so technically we're all good here look how happy all of these people are jesus will want us to be happy Thank you so much. This is what happens when Christian extremists attend pride parades. People simply walk up and debate them. That's it. There's no go kill the Christian for being Christian or whatever nonsense. This is simply put persecution propaganda. They must feel persecuted. Next page. Kill that footage, you fool. You want to make us look bad? I'm sorry, Commissioner. Go back and shoot the rest of the parade. Two days later. You're charged with a hate crime, Mr. Wesley, because you acted in hatred against us by blocking our parade. You now face a prison sentence. This literally never happened, and it never will happen. You know why? There are free speech laws in the United States. If you threaten to kill somebody, if you instigate imminent harm to somebody, then you can be put in jail, then you can be charged for it, rightfully so. But if you're simply speaking your mind in America, you are not gonna be jailed for it. But continue on with your persecution complex. However, we'll drop the charges if you change your hateful attitude. We brought our minister to show you the error of your ways. Hi, I'm Reverend Ray, and I'm gay, and Jesus loves me. Hi, I'm Zena, and I hate your guts. There's a devil-looking character standing next to him. That's Zena, I suppose. There's text underneath the image. For Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it's no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness. 2 Corinthians 11, 14 to 15. Next page. Bob, did you hear? Malcolm's in the county hospital. He's under arrest for a hate crime. Malcolm, a hate crime? That's ridiculous. I'm on my way. What, does she have a lawyer on speed dial? If you agree to listen to our pastor, we'll drop the charges. Oh, he's a pastor, okay. Reverend Ray is a Bible scholar. He'll make you understand. It's under control now, officer. We drop the charges. Take off. Yes, sir. You guys don't leave. It ain't over yet. It's kind of hard to understand the context of what's happening here, even sitting here looking at the pages. But I think what's happening is they told this guy that they dropped the charges if they just heard out the pro-gay reverend. So he did. And then they said, all right, it's under control. We dropped the charges. You can leave now. 
and the devil says, no, you can't leave. I want to hurt this person more. Brother Malcolm, God loves all his children, including gays. He understands we were born this way because he made us. But uh, what about Sodom and Gomorrah? Shame on you. You sound like all the other bigots. You must drop this hateful attitude. If I've said this once, I've said it a thousand times. Sodom and Gomorrah was not a story about gay people. It was a story about the ill treatment of the poor according to the book of Ezekiel. So anytime you see something in the Bible about sodomy or Sodom and Gomorrah, it's not denigrating gay people. It's saying that mistreating guests and mistreating the poor is evil. Since I'm talking about it, I might as well address Leviticus 20, 13. The book of Leviticus is irrelevant to Christian doctrine. We gave up the Ten Commandments and the other 603 commandments, as a matter of fact. We gave up the Mosaic Law when we became Christians, although I'm an atheist. But the point is, Christians don't follow the old law. They follow the new law that Jesus instituted, replacing the old law, which is love your neighbor as yourself and love God with your whole heart, soul, mind, body, and strength. Leviticus 20, 13 is just as irrelevant as the verse that talks about not eating pork not shaving your beard into a V, not eating shellfish, not wearing cotton and linen blends, it's all just as irrelevant. So unless you avoid pork, Leviticus 20, 13 is irrelevant. And another thing, the Mosaic law laid out the expectations culturally, but the Jews are the ones that maintained that culture throughout the generations. Back in Jesus' time, the Pharisees, that's modern day Judaism. The Pharisees uniquely believed that Moses didn't just bring down the old law, the Mosaic law, he also brought down oral commandments, basically how the culture was supposed to behave, the things that you were supposed to value and devalue. And since Moses didn't write those down, they shouldn't write them down either. However, when the temple fell in 70 CE, like 30 something years after Jesus died, the Pharisees decided we have to write this stuff down now. It's imperative in case it's lost, in case one of us dies and, and it's gone forever. So the Pharisees wrote it down, wrote down the oral commandments that the Jews have followed for generations. And they included the Mosaic law in that, the parts that they followed. They wrote down their cultural values, basically, and it was called the Talmud. There are two translations of the Talmud. There's the Jerusalem Talmud and the Babylonian one. The newer one from 400 years after Jesus died is considered the most detailed and accurate and valuable list of Jewish laws and expectations. And guess what they excluded from the Talmud? They excluded the bit about being gay. You know why? Because it wasn't a cultural value that was followed. Yes, it was in the old law, the Mosaic law, Leviticus 20, 13 but nobody actually got punished for being gay. Nobody actually got killed for that. It was irrelevant to their culture actually. And you know what? I think I'm gonna take Jews' word for Jews' holy texts, not some random Christian who's looking for the basis to persecute people. And one more thing on the subject. Evangelical extremists will always find a reason to hate the things that they hate, and they'll find biblical justifications for it. For example, they're anti-abortion, but the Bible is pro-abortion. Numbers 5, 11 to 23. It is in favor of abortion. It says you should get abortions if your wife cheats on you, for example. It even instructs people how to perform the abortions. At no point ever does the Bible condemn abortion, ever. But evangelical Christians still find their justification to say that abortion is wrong. And you know that verse in the Bible that's used to condemn touching yourself? for it's better to spill your seed in the belly of a whore than on the ground, something to that effect? No, you don't. It's fake. It's a fake verse. That's not in the Bible. That verse was made up by somebody and presented as though it was real to generations of children so they wouldn't touch themselves. There is no biblical command against doing that. None. The arguments that I've heard against what I just pointed out, the fact that it's not in the Bible, go like this. Do you really want to live tangential to sin? Do you want to see how far you can get to sin without crossing the line? If you get as close as you can to sin without crossing the line, then you're going to hell anyway. No! People would go to hell in that system if they sinned. Simple as that. That was never condemned. They even fabricate verses to back up their points and beliefs. They fake stuff. 
I simply don't accept the stuff that they're laying down here because it's ridiculous. They found justifications for their own hatred. Let's keep reading. What about Sodom and Gomorrah? Shame on you. You sound like all the other bigots. You must drop this hateful attitude. The right-wing extremists deliberately changed the Bible story of Sodom so they could attack us. Now here's the truth. That's true. Absolutely, they did. Jack Chick, as is standard with this guy, is creating fictitious scenarios and then knocking them down. It's called a straw man. Let's see, Lord. Malcolm is in room 220. No, this could ruin everything, says the devil. In Ezekiel 16:49, the prophet tells us why Sodom was punished. The real sin was arrogance. No, it was their mistreatment of the poor, but okay. And they didn't help the poor. It was inhospitality. That's absolutely true. Inhospitality? But, but wait, I thought it was a sexual thing. Uh, uh, my head. No, you're confused. He's not confused. You're perverting the word of God. You forgot about Jude verse 7. I'm going to pray right now. Lord, cast all the devils out of this room. Heal Malcolm and save this game minister in Jesus' name. What happened? Everything's brighter. Bye, Ray. As a team, we sure ruined lots of kids. Right, because it's about co-opting kids. It's about warping kids' brains. It's always about kids being gay, right? Jude, verse 7. It's one chapter long. Likewise, Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which, in the same manner as they indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural lust, serve as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. The reason Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed, though, was because of their ill treatment of the poor. The story goes like this. Abraham argues with God about the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. He says, if I find 10 faithful men in the city, will you destroy it then? And God says, no, if you find 10 faithful men, I won't. He says, what about five? God says, nope, I guess not. He says, what about one faithful person? Will you destroy it then? God says, no, but go find the person and then I'm destroying it. So Abraham goes into the city, finds Lot and his family, and the people in the city want to take advantage of the people who just came to visit. Their ill treatment of guests and the poor. And instead, Lot gives over his daughters. That isn't about being gay. Sure, they were going to commit a gay act, maybe, but the problem was mistreating guests, ill treatment of the poor, and sexual assault. I'll put it that way. This isn't Owen Morgan speaking, by the way. This isn't me that's coming up with this. This is scholars in the field, Bart Ehrman, Jeffrey Sykes, and others talk about this at length. Okay, I don't know the Bible. I'm not a Bible expert. I have to rely on other people's understanding. You know, people who have worked in the field for 30 years, who speak Hebrew, Aramaic, Greek, Akkadian, and all these other languages fluently, who can read them. Yeah, I don't know how to do that stuff, so I have to rely on those people. And what they are saying is that this is an incorrect interpretation. The interpretation being handed to us by Jack Chick. Anyway, let's keep reading here. The story of Sodom and Gomorrah is found in Genesis 18, 19, 29. God told Abraham that he was going to destroy the city of Sodom. And Abraham said, Wilt thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Too bad Abraham wasn't around to argue this for Noah's flood, right? He pleaded with God to spare it if there were 50 righteous people, or 40, or 30, or 20, or 10. I will not destroy it for 10's sake. But there were not even 10 in all the cities of the plain. God sent two angels to rescue Abraham's nephew, Lot, who lived in Sodom. Send them out that we may know them. That night, all of the men in the city tried to sleep with the angels. The angels blinded the Sodomites and physically pulled Lot and his wife and two daughters out of the city so God's judgment could hit. Lot did give over his two daughters, didn't he? So it sounds like it wasn't about being gay. It sounds like it was about sexual assault and mistreating guests. Again, not Owen Morgan's interpretation. So the angels took Lot, his wife, and two daughters out of the city so God's judgment could hit. Next page. And it did. All the men and women died in flames and instantly went to hell. Quote, Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. The accurate, trusted version of the Bible by scholars says, In the same manner as they indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural lust, and they serve as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. That seems to be the most accurate interpretation. To God, homosexuality is no joke. 
The Word of God is loaded with verses warning us about it. Yeah, six verses total. Six verses even mention it in any way and to any degree. Out of 32,000. Loaded with verses. Absolutely. And God's eyes don't miss a thing. He sees it all and everything is being recorded. Now, you know that little ditty right there is the thing that got my sister to change clothes under the kitchen table so God didn't see her changing. This leads to strange behavior, and it shouldn't be fed to children that way. Malcolm lovingly tried to warn homosexuals of God's coming judgment. So, who committed the hate crime, Malcolm or the guys who almost beat him to death? Ah, I see, flipping the narrative so that the Christian is the victim here. In this scenario, there would be no hate crime if this were an actual real scenario, because they didn't beat him for being Christian. In this scenario, they beat him for hating who they are, for spreading nonsense about them, for claiming that they come for children and all that other stuff. And it wouldn't have been the Christian because he didn't commit violent acts against somebody. He didn't commit a violent crime against them simply because they're gay. Tell me, Ray, of all the sins, lying, adultery, stealing, etc., can you think of any other sin where God himself wiped out entire cities to remove that sin? I mean, I can think of genocides that God ordered for all kinds of reasons. I can think of a gigantic flood that God ordered for various different sins. But the God of the New Testament, the God of the Old Testament are completely different from each other. Either way, I don't know what point he's getting to. No, no, I can't. Help him, Lord. Man, I'm seeing everything in a different light. Oh God, I'm in trouble. How many young people have I enticed into the gay lifestyle? The gay lifestyle. Love it. The gay lifestyle choice. I'm facing God covered with the responsibility of ruining their lives. I've held rallies and gay pride parades. I've cursed pastors as being bigots. I've even preached that Jesus was gay. Will that put me into hell? Okay, I don't think Jesus was gay, but it is kind of weird that he like walked around with like 12 guys all the time, right? I'm just saying, it's kind of strange. And by the way, like which pastor in the world right now is preaching that Jesus was affirmatively gay? Our sin puts all of us in hell, and Ray, you need a savior, and I mean today. You know what it cost God to get rid of all our sins? It took God Almighty himself to become a man and shed his precious blood and die for us. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Romans 3.10. Did they get the point of Romans 3.10? Did they get the point that people are responsible for their own actions and it's not on you to pester them about what they're doing? Not on you to judge? That went right over his head, I guess. Now, about Jesus shedding his precious blood to die for us, that is absolutely depraved behavior. Why would God require himself to sacrifice himself to himself to appease himself even assuming the trinity isn't real jack chick believes it is but even assuming it's not punishing somebody else for someone's sins is wrong it's evil that's not how a society should work that's not what should be expected it's immoral behavior you should not die for your dad's sins or your kids sins or whatever Quote, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. John 3.16 I quoted that so much when I was a Jehovah's Witness. The Word was God, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. John 1, 1-14 That's crazy! Jesus died on a cross, but he was only a man! No, Ray, he is God, and he proved it by rising from the dead. The Trinity is not real. It is not biblical. Jesus didn't believe that he was God. He didn't even seem to believe that he was the son of man, the foretold prophet. But his apostles did believe that about him. They did not, however, believe that he was God. That didn't come until hundreds of years later. The Lord Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. John 14, 6. Those are the most important words ever spoken. But what about all the different religions of the world? I'm sorry, but there's only one way into heaven, and it's Jesus. I'm not going to fight God anymore. What should I do? Repent, Ray. Turn to Christ. Believe that he died for your sins, and receive him as your Savior. Lord, I've seen all you've been doing. I know I'm a sinner. I repent and turn to you. Lord Jesus, I trust that you died for my sins and receive you as my Savior. Please save me. Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your skins are as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Isaiah 118. And here's the final page. It happened. Jesus is real. I know I'm saved. I feel like a new person. 
Thank God you showed me the truth. Quote, if the Son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. No f***ing sh If the Son makes you free, then you'll be free. Wow, someone makes you free, then you'll be free. Reader, it's now time to make your choice. If you choose Jesus Christ, all of your sins will be forgiven and you'll receive God's free gift of eternal life. If you do nothing, you'll remain a condemned child of Satan and one heartbeat from hell. Choose Christ right now. As you can see, it's nothing but fear-mongering garbage. And it's biblically and doctrinally inaccurate. Anyway, that's all I've got for you. Don't forget to check out my book and check out my Patreon. Links to both are in the description. Okay, thanks for watching, guys.